Sandro, Vlad, welcome back at CodeCamp. Hello, Don. Hello, everyone at CodeCamp. Always good to be here. Definitely. Um, yeah, so we have a cool subject ahead of us, craftsmanship in AI. And we have here uh, the software craftsman. That's how I look at you, Sandro. <laughs> and coincidentally, it's also the name of your book, right? <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What a coincidence. <laughs> and then Vlad, Vlad uh, has been a uh, software engineer for a long while, but lately he's uh, involved in a lot of, in building a lot of uh, AI powered product. So I think it's the right uh, mix. And I can make uh, bad jokes as we go along. So uh, quite the group. Yeah, we're going to have a bit, a bit of uh, fun time, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I know I don't know anything about AI, right? So, so I think that I'll probably ask a lot of stupid questions. Like, I'm really looking forward to to the discussion and see if I can learn something actually, because like this is an area that I'm not that strong, let's say. Well, I'm not but, sure how many strong strong people are there. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all learning. That's also the goal of uh, mm -hmm. this type of sessions. Uh, but then, once in a while, we do have this conversation. Um, yeah, do the principles or practices from traditional software development, do they still apply in AI and how? Uh, so I know, to kick this off, maybe we should uh, uh, discuss a bit what uh, craftsmanship is in the end, or software craftsmanship in our case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandro, okay. so, yeah I probably can I, I probably can can try <laughs> it's very difficult for me to define but like there are two different aspects to it there is uh, what was almost like a counter movement so there is software craftsmanship as a movement and there is software craftsmanship as a mindset yeah and one led to the other so I'll try to be brief. I don't want to tell the whole history of Agile and craftsmanship. I think I've done that a few times already, but like just, just for the new people that are not so familiar with the terminology. So Agile uh, was, the Agile as a movement was created like 20 years exactly, uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it was a movement by developers focusing software development. I believe that many of us uh, were excited about it. But as Agile evolved, the focus became more on the process side, on the management side, and less so on the technical disciplines. And people like myself and Bob Martin and many other people around the world, we were a bit disappointed that Agile moved away from the technical disciplines. So a new counter movement, let's say, as Agile became popular, emerged. And that was a software craftsmanship movement that would bring the focus back to technical practices and technical excellence. That was the movement. And loads of other communities, craftsmanship communities were created around the world and conference and so on and so forth and books. And... But then this is the movement. But then there is the mindset. And I think that this is probably where I would like to focus more. Uh, so in terms of software craftsmanship mindset, it's more about uh, the way you see the world, the way that you combine, for example, there are a few aspects to it, to the mindset as well. So one of them is how do you incorporate your profession to who you are? So that division that some people make between the personal life and professional life. So this is something that craftsmanship, almost like as a purpose to become a more, uh, uh, how can I say, complete a person. You unify your professional side and your all the different sides into a single person, right? So you, you incorporate your profession to who you are. That is the, the element of mastery as well, right? Of always trying to be the best you can be, because this is something that you enjoy, it's something that is part of you, and it gives you pleasure to become good at what you do for the sake of being good, not because someone is paying you. Just uh, And that is that, that aspect, that, that, that shift also uh, from how you provide your service, regardless if you're a permanent employee, a, a contractor, if you work for a consultancy, but there is a mind shift with craftsmanship as well that says, I am a professional, I'm, a, I'm providing a service, and one of my main goals is to delight my clients, regardless if they are your employer or an end client and so. So this is 
this focus on providing a good service, delighting your clients, and that professionalism that you talk about. So those are different aspects of the mindset. But basically, it's also so. I, I think uh, to me, it's, and as you say, it's about caring about what you do, right, and continually developing your skills. And I think basically that applies. You you, you can be a craftsman, yeah, in software, in in machine learning, in I don't know, in, in drawing comic books, if you want. But basically, mm -hmm. right, th these this is the the thing that you're looking for. It, it, it's to to continually learn, continually get better at what you do and, and to care about it. Exactly, exactly that. That. that is exactly that. So this is why the metaphor, uh, which metaphors are complicated because like they, they are meant to, to, to focus in one point. So you cannot stretch a metaphor too much because the metaphor breaks. But the, the aspect of the metaphor that was important was the, 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 the real cross people. Right, the people that had a craft, that they 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 enjoy doing that craft or practicing that craft, becoming very good at that craft, but ultimately they were also providing that craft to someone, right? So they were providing a service to someone. So they took pleasure on it, in in becoming good at it and providing a good service to someone. So and and they also the a cross person in the early days also incorporated being a cross person to who they were. It was also a mindset, right? Almost a lifestyle in, in, in the early days. Yeah, so, so basically you also need the uh, cost, air quotes, customer, right? Somebody to, yeah, to, to serve a client, some sort. It, it would be odd not to have one. Right, so because if you don't have one, you can still be a craftsperson, you can still do that, like for example, again, through the metaphor, you could still work on your craft without selling that, without providing that service. Uh, it still would be fine, the mindset of, but then it would be focused more on the mastery side of things and the fulfillment or the purpose, even like uh, aspect of it, less so on the professionalism side of it right which is totally fine as well but the mindset is quite important maybe i'm know? idealistic here sorry to interrupt you Vlad, but uh, this was in my mind for a while now uh isn't this the normality i mean you keep hearing uh, differences between uh, a software craftsperson and a software engineer but isn't that what we should aspire to and then what you do also if you think about another side of things because a craft person would uh, pass on uh, their skills, right, to apprentice. Mm -hmm. And that in your teams, you get sometimes juniors that you mentor and coach and help them grow. So it's pretty much what we do as software engineers. And yeah, you have good or great software engineers and not so good <laughs> software engineers, I guess. The, 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 I, I, for example, there is, when you are very passionate about what you do, in this case, is our profession. Uh, so, of course, that you, you are more inclined to spend time teaching other people or sharing your knowledge, learning from others as well. When, when you don't have that kind of relationship with your profession, and, and that's, I always say that that's for me, there is a big difference between a profession and a job, right? So they are distinct. You, a profession is a collection of jobs, but like, when you say, when you talk about profession, it's, it's part of who you are. You say, I am a uh, software engineer. I, you, you don't say like, uh, I write, I work for a company. You might say, of course, if you're saying, who do you work for? You might say, I work for this company. But but it's like a doctor. A doctor says, I'm a, I'm a doctor. They don't say, I work as I a doctor. Know. I work as a doctor. Exactly, exactly. Right? So, so I think that that relationship is quite important. And is it, for, I met people that don't have that relationship with their profession and they are great professionals, don't get me wrong. Uh, so from my perspective, in terms of the, the skills that they have and how they apply those skills, they are cross people. They just don't have that strong relationship with the profession, but those are exceptional cases. Normally the, the people that are quite outstanding what they do, they have a, a very strong relationship with their profession. 
Indeed. And then, so this is the mindset part of things, right? Mm -hmm. But then when we, if you look at, because uh, we were going to talk about projects, whether they're AI mm -hmm. or traditional. If you look at a regular project, how does this, uh, how do this mindset or principles, how do they apply? And yeah, so, so this, this, is where it get, yeah, this is where it gets very interesting because it, it is all well and good to say, no, I care about what I do, I, I like what I do and stuff, but, but it's very easy, very cheap to say this. I'm a professional, I like what I do, I, I try to do a good job. But, but you, you identify that in the behaviors, in how the person behaves, which practices they use. So, right. So, so, so then you need to have a translation from what you say you like and you do to what you actually do and how you actually behave. So there are also slightly different aspects to the materialization, let's say, of craftsmanship in projects. One, you tend to see that people that embrace craftsmanship, and again, this is not just the cross person. There are other people as well, but I'm talking about cross people in general. Uh, they tend to be to worry about a broader set of aspects in a project. They are not just worried about the actual craft of the code. They normally are a bit more uh, interested in understanding the service that they are providing, the business value that they are providing. They are thinking about how can we maximize the return on investment for the person that is paying me or the company that is paying me. So, so that, that is that aspect. They are a bit broader in the things that they care about. On the technical side, they have some very strong drives. They normally, they, you can see, for example, they would be, they will have a very strong drive to quality, whatever that is a debate of what do we mean by quality, uh, because people have different uh, interpretations of quality, but regardless, they will be trying to do their best and they will always be focused on quality. They normally focus a lot in testing and automation. So craftsmanship really brought that uh, thing about developers focus on testing and automation in general. Uh, so, so I think those are key things that you clearly can see in a group that call themselves cross people and stuff. So they, they as I said, you identify that in, outside that group as well, but it's far more prominent in general, in people that identify themselves with craftsmanship. I think you make a really good point here in that, so what I'm taking from this is also that craftsmanship depends on the context, on, on what you're trying to achieve, or mm -hmm. not, not, not necessarily, sorry, uh, not depends, but should apply itself to the context. So for example, if you're building on an enterprise software and you have uh, two years to deliver, by all means, go, you should not leave without building a CICD pipeline. You should not <laughs> start the second mm -hmm. day without building a yeah. testing project. Whereas if you, I don't know, if you build a quick proof of concept or if you're building a first page startup, probably speed is of the essence. So then yeah. you might get away without building text, tests. Probably sure. you, don't, you won't get away without building a CICD pipeline. You never get away without that. But, but, uh, I think it's also it's also important to highlight uh, not to be too, and I, I think you do highlight this, not to be too, yeah, uh, I don't know, zealot in applying uh, this. So I shall not start a project without having tests. Okay, but maybe you need to deliver that project in two days. And um, the, the, there are, do there I are make sense? Do you think? No, you do it. Right you or? do. You do it. So so here here's the right. thing, right? So. Mastering skills is more than just knowing about them. It's about being able to apply them in the right context and in a very easy way, right? So you feel very comfortable to apply something because you master that thing, but you are also able to apply that within a context. So for example, when you start mastering a set of architectural styles or ways of working, you can tailor those skills that you have, that knowledge that you have. To, so it's like, what would be the most beneficial approach for the context that we have? For example, you mentioned a startup. Let's take the, the, the difference between uh, a startup and by startup, let's try to qualify this a bit more. Let's say that it is a company that needs to iterate really fast. And they are, let's say they are, the startup, they are 
uh, break in a new, create a new thing that is you cannot go to users and ask because there's no user base for that yet. They are innovating. So it's, it's an innovation startup, right? So which means that they only can get feedback once they push something out. They cannot do user research. They need to iterate fast, push something out, get, get some, some, some feedback, inspect and adapt. So in order to achieve that, you need to architect your system in a way where this is possible. Those quick experiments are possible. But if you are in a more traditional, well, in a more stable market where you can do some customer research, you have a customer base where you have a, already a market for the product that you are building, you can do that user research. Let's say you are in a B2B place. Every feature that you release needs to be production ready, which means that the process that you have, the architecture that you use is significantly different in those two cases. And mastering those architecture skills means that you can easily spot those differences and apply the right process and technologies. Absolutely. Um, while we talk about this, sometimes we get uh, questions from the audience. So maybe it's worth uh, taking some along the way since we just uh, talk about this. Uh, I think you can see it as well, right? I yes. think it's, it's something you were saying, Sandro. So uh, if uh, you see, or I can all answer it, if we see a trend on focusing uh, on a certain matter and uh, leaving something out that uh, As a position for business value or improving overall product, do you see a trend of focusing on key subject only instead of, I'm not sure if I understand the question, something like it's not my job. Oh, uh, I see. So let me see if I understood. Uh, the question is about like someone that prefer just to work in a very specific area without worrying too much about the rest. Is that? That's how I perceive it as well. And then, or maybe, uh... I'm thinking that it can apply also to uh, people that are saying, yeah, I'm focusing on so this uh, side of technology or this part, and then uh, the rest is not my job. It could be something like this. Okay, so as I feel that the question is a bit ambiguous, I will answer how I understood that. And uh, okay, I think Andre just put more context. Uh, I'm asking because I've seen actual business leaders ask for devs to focus on their own area and leave some someone else to do the higher up architecture. Okay, so this is, uh, from what I understood from Andre comments here is that uh, some people prefer to box people. Let's say a manager or a head of department to say, hey Vlad, you are an uh, AI specialist. So don't come here and start talking about things that are nothing to do with you and send the same thing. You are, I hired you because you have this area of expertise and I don't want you to be talking about other things. If that is a behavior from management and uh, the leadership team, I think that is very short-sighted, right? From their parts, because like uh, some people specialize in areas, but they they also develop some breadth across those areas, like AI and cross machine and, and other things. They need to coexist. They need to collaborate. Uh, there is also an element of the person itself as well. Like someone might say, look, I'm specialized in X, in, and I don't want to be involved in other things. And this is sometimes a bit complicated uh, as well, because like whatever you are doing as a professional, you are doing that within an ecosystem. And you need to have at least uh, a good understanding and even curiosity of your neighboring uh, disciplines so that you can coexist, right? But I think that there's still an area for, uh, I just want to compliment, there is a need for specialists, right? Someone that is highly specialized in a subject. They might have a short breadth of knowledge, but they have a very deep depth of knowledge in an area. So I think that companies need specialists, but the behavior of a specialist is to be very good at what they do, but also curious about the neighboring areas and discipline. Yeah, if you know, there's that concept of a uh, team mind the uh, professional or person where it says that's shaped like a T and that means you're very good and specialized on a certain thing, but then you have enough knowledge on the adjacent disciplines, even to the level that can practice them a bit. You're not as good as proficient as those person, but you can understand and can work together. But one yeah. of the definitions that uh, struck me was that uh, 
up to the level where you can even practice them a bit. And in my head, it's always this, because uh, especially in the past uh, uh, years or even decade, that the separation, for instance, from backend and front end engineers uh, grew uh, more and more. Uh, and it's fine because we need this specialization as also new technologies uh, appear. Uh, but at the same time, I always felt that in a team, right, you should not uh, create bottlenecks. So then I specialize on the back end, but if I need to do something quick on the front end to be able to test uh, my thing or see it working, I can do that. And then more specialized people will come and uh, make yeah, it but better. There are, there are boundaries, right? So I don't want to deviate too much from the, the actual topic of this meeting, but for example, Oh, let's say, let's say I, I'm curious about AI, but I would never be able to, well, it would be a mistake for someone to hire me instead of Vlad to do an AI project, because at the end of the day, we need a specialist to solve those problems. And there is the concept of, as I was saying, neighboring disciplines, because like, how far do you go with, with the, the breadth? Because one thing is for me to have a, a, an area of a, uh, expertise and have a certain degree of proficiency in the neighboring disciplines, but how wide do you go? Because at some point you need to draw a line. You know? Right, but for instance, yeah, there should be, a, for instance, if uh, Vlad builds a, a machine learning model and then mm -hmm. uh, you need to work with him and expose it as an API, mm -hmm. then probably you need to have some uh, this purpose it. understanding and how yes. it works and yeah. engage in some conversation but, or have the, Let's say it's not even that. I think it's have the inclination to find out more and to be curious about it. In fact, this is like this is probably related to this discussion because this is where I see traditional projects uh, getting very close to AI and ML projects. Because and Vlad, correct me if I'm wrong, because you certainly have way more experience than me in this case. But I see, for example, the projects where we had elements of AI and, and, and ML. Uh, there were some highly specialized people with skills that we don't have. There is a very scientific mind and algorithmic mind and stuff. The, the, the core engineering principles that are applied, they are different from the engineering principles that we apply. It's still engineering principles, but, but different. The, but for example, we were not able, I was not able to maintain an ML or AI project, I myself, right? But quite often we take those systems and they also struggle to integrate those algorithms, that, that machinery, uh, into the wider ecosystem systems you were mentioning done, exposing APIs or, or having the data flowing into a place so the, the ML uh, algorithms can use or pipe that out to other places. So that's where a lot of integration from traditional projects and ML happen, at least in my experience. I don't know about you, Vlad. How do you see that? Well, uh, that, that's that's also my experience. So, for for one, I think the the machine learning part is this small uh, as compared to to the rest of the project. You no, know? because um, well, let, let, let's take it like this. Yeah, in traditional so systems, you you program with code, but in in machine learning systems, you you program with data and some some code. Yeah, but but you use large amounts of data to to program so so it's it's a whole different ball game plus uh, a significant part of the difficulty is bringing that data you know into into your system making sure uh, your model is trained on the right data is trained enough uh, it's uh, making sure it's monitored right because uh, you know in um, yeah, again, in, in traditional systems, once you deploy it, you kind of know it's running, mm -hmm. right? Most of the time it's, it's yeah. running uh, un yeah. unless something, some node fails somewhere, it kind of works or, or your Azure subscription just mm -hmm. uh, got uh, disabled. But, but in machine learning, you know, um, the data can change, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, or your model uh, can, can get out of date. No, so so it's not uh, it's, it's not just about building the best model that can uh, I don't know predict whatever you wanted to predict at a given time. It's building that model and maintaining it uh, across the lifetime of the project. That's the difficulty. And how, how do you know? Yeah, how do you know, Vlad, uh, that 
for example, a specific model is not more suit is not suitable anymore, or you need to evolve the model because how where does this requirement come from? See what I'm saying? So oh oh, I think our model is not quite right. How how do you do that? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um... Well, first of all, what, well, let's say you, you're building a uh, machine learning system, right? And you picked a good model, you, you have a good feeling about it, uh, you've deployed it to production, and, and now what? You know, what happens? Well, hopefully you've discussed with, uh, with a stakeholder some performance criteria that you're already meeting, right? Some, some metrics, let's say, uh, I don't know, if it, uh, if it wants to detect uh, you know, to, to predict the weather outside in a given month, it, it does so with, uh, within, I don't know, one degree plus minus. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're doing that. But then you need to build the monitoring uh, capabilities necessary to detect that the model um, model's predictions are still within that plus one, minus one degrees uh, over time. Yeah, you, you need to, to build that. Or let, let's say the stakeholder comes and says, look, you've done a bang up job, but now let, let's, uh, let's decrease the error rate to uh, 0.5 degrees, right? Not minus one, minus plus one, just minus uh, 05. So just, uh, just make it better. And then oh, I presumably, see. So, uh -huh. yes. No, just, just to see if I understood. So, so basically, like you create a, uh, a set of algorithms that will try to predict something and then you validate that model with reality. So as you are evolving, you are taking the, the, the weather case, for example, now that we know the temperature for tomorrow, like we are already tomorrow and we know the temperature of that day. And so, okay, how that model predicted the temperature for today? And then you start calibrating that model and given the, the, the margin of error, that you have and try to narrow the margin of error down, is it? Yes, yes, so, something like that. So uh, hopefully uh, you've tested this model before taking it to production, right? So, so how this works is uh, since you're programming with data, mm -hmm. the, the simplest thing to do and the, the, the most, uh, the baddest, the worst one is just train a model on a training set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you want to see how well that model uh, predicts mm -hmm. what you want to predict. And then you evaluate it on the same training set that you used to train it, right? right. So, so you show it, let, let's say some, some data, you say, I don't know, on Monday it's warm, Tuesday is cold. And then you, you ask him, but what's the weather on Monday? And he knows it's warm because that's in the training data, right? right. But what you want to achieve is uh, to have it tell you how good is the weather on Wednesday, right? On data that it hasn't seen yet. So right. this is why a, a first approach is to just split this uh, this data set that you've somehow built or downloaded, split it in, into two two sub data sets. One that's only used for, to train the model, right? And the other mm -hmm. that's used to test the performance of the model. Yeah, because what you want to see while developing is how well the, the model um, acts in unknown circumstances, right? And the data that it hasn't seen, it's unknown data, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is a first approach. Of course, uh, and this is where the, the machine learning, the data science uh, part comes in, that data may be biased, right? Because it's randomly picked, right? Mm -hmm. It's either randomly picked or it's picked by you and either the random number generator has a bias or you have a bias, somebody has bias both, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you might get a false feeling of security uh, towards your model's performance. So uh, what is usually done, especially when you don't have a huge, um, huge data set, is mm -hmm. uh, you know, do this training and evaluation process once, then switch the training data set. Pick another random training data set and another random testing data set, compute the performance again, and then do that again and again and again, I don't know, five times, 10 times, 20 times. Mm -hmm and then get an average error for the model. Mm -hmm. So then you, you, you get to get a feel, uh, you start to get a feel of how your model, um, how your model's performance looks like in mm -hmm. unknown circumstances, right? Like it will be when you deploy it. And then mm -hmm. when you deploy it, you need to build in the monitoring necessary 
to make sure that the model actually stays within those error margins that you calculate, or else something has gone really wrong. Let's see. Uh, I have like uh, Dan. I don't know if you want to interrupt or not because as Vlad is talking, like uh, I already have a few questions in my head. So I don't know how we want to organize that because like there are quite a few things that I want to ask Vlad now. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Maybe uh, let me just put like one question and then done. If you want to take the conversation to another direction, stop okay. us, right? I'll give um, you one question. Okay. <laughs> so we were discussing before uh, in a previous conversation about the different technique uh, techniques that you apply in a traditional uh, project and uh, in a AI project, right? So you mentioned model quite a few times as you were talking, training the model, evolving the model. So in traditional projects, there is a huge focus on building a domain model, as we call it. And there are loads of different techniques of building a domain model. And, and you can build a domain model at multiple levels of abstraction as well, from a few classes all the way to different services in a microservices architecture. So you have the boundary of your models can vary significantly from, from a method in a class all the way to a group of microservices, right? So there are loads of techniques in getting, in defining those models at those different levels. And a lot of people, just to give an example, so people watching uh, understand what I'm, where I'm coming from. Like you talk about domain-driven design, bounded contexts, how do you create? How, how much behavior do you put together? What is a bounded context? How do you define that? So there is data that, what is the data that this context owns? What is the data that this context needs? How do you separate that? And then there are multiple perspectives. For example, how many different types of actors will interact with that domain? Actors being people, uh, internal or external, or even systems. Uh, so, uh, what kind of performance issues that you might expect or, or, or operational uh, requirements, let's say, that's another perspective that you take to isolate bounded context. Uh, regulations and compliance is another perspective that you take into account when isolate bounded context. So, those are just a few examples of techniques and ways of splitting bounded context and defining the domain. So, when you talk about uh, building a model, what kind of skills go into build a model? And what kind of model do you build? Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer to a slightly different question. Okay. <laughs> I, I made a very <laughs> wrong question. I'm not, I'm not, not going to answer that. <laughs> I'm going to imagine you asked something totally different. Exactly. Yeah, good effort asking that question, but I'm going to ignore. <laughs> no, no, but but because uh, I, I have, uh, uh, and then I'll get back to this. <laughs> Just, uh, but but the, to me, the the practices that are um, most valuable, well. Um, doing machine learning, so so not just when building models, you know, but when, when building machine learning systems, let, let's, uh, let's put it like that, are uh, um, versioning, reproducibility, and monitoring. Uh, and, and let me tell you why why uh, why I think uh, that's the case. Now, on the one hand, uh, I, I think, and yeah, not, not not just me. There are articles about it. Machine learning has a reproducibility problem. Yeah, because um, you don't just need to, um, to version the code. Yeah? Versioning the code is easy. We have mature, really mature tools mm -hmm. for this. Uh, versioning models, again, de depending on the size of the model, it might be easy or it might be a bit harder. But then there's the, the data version. You know, because data is a, a huge part of, of building the model, right? And uh, so, so let, let me give you an example. Uh, yeah, somebody messed up two years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. if they messed up uh, while writing the code, it's, it's quite easy. You just look at the Git history, you yeah. identify the mistake, it's there. But if yeah. they messed up while collecting samples mm -hmm. on which they train the machine learning model, fingers crossed somebody has a folder somewhere 
<laughs> with the samples, but the otherwise they're... drive somewhere. <laughs> yeah, who, who knows what were the correct uh, values? Uh, it's it, it's a bit harder, you know. It, it's a bit harder. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, uh, let, just just to, um, to just to tell a small story. No, uh, you know, remember, uh, I think it was 15 years ago where when Git started. You know, so uh, the Linux project, we, we had source safe and subversion. Everybody was yeah, using source yeah. safe uh -huh. and subversion, which, you know, for those who haven't used them, they were a joy to use the branch. <laughs> Making a branch meant you make, made another folder exactly. and pushed it. Yeah, it, it was beautiful. <laughs> uh, so, but, but the Linux uh, project used another source control system. That they used BitKeeper, which kind of kind of looked like Git looks today, right? But mm -hmm. BitKeeper was proprietary. They revoked the license for the Linux project because of some licensing issues. And uh, several distributed uh, source version, um, source control systems appeared. Yeah, it was Git, it was Mercurial, uh, and a few others, right? And, and Git won, unfortunately. Uh, but <laughs> It, I, I feel that in machine learning um, tool sets, we're, we're just building our source safe. We're just building SVN. So we're not at, even at the Git level. Yeah, it, 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 the, the, tool set, uh, the tools are really immature. Everybody's building them. And, and some will win, some won't win. But I, I feel that, yeah, we're, we're 15 years ago when doing software development, from, from a development practices uh, extent. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. I see. Um, uh, I actually right. wanted to know about the kind of model that you built. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so I use AutoML. I, I don't, the, the system builds it for me. Right. <laughs> yeah, because, you, you know, uh, about to, to, to really answer the question. So what, what practices? Um, I think it's important to, to evaluate the model, but I, also while building a, a machine learning system, I think it's important not to start with machine learning. Mm. So just, just to not, don't dive in, don't, uh, don't build a huge neural network just to, so you can put that on your resume. Mm. Uh, it, I, I'd say it's better to, when, when building a, an ML system, to just use a heuristic, mm. you know, or the simplest model that works because, you know, the advantages of a simple model is that uh, it's simple to deploy. Uh, it's simple to debug. Yeah, let, let's say uh, you pick, I don't know, linear regressions, or just, which is in essence just an equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can look at the weights. You can see, I don't know, when when predicting the weather outside. Yeah, it. Um, you can understand the features and how it interprets them and how it uses them to make a prediction. Whereas if you build a, an n-layer neural network, it's somewhat harder, if not impossible, to understand that, right? And when you're just building that system, it's really important to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Plus, your, your model won't live in, um, in isolation. Yeah, it should not live in isolation. It should not live on, a, on your computer and just get involved while, <laughs> when the boss is asking, look, give me predictions and mm -hmm. pick run and type, type and you that, that's that's job security yes but it's not craftsmanship um so so ideally you would deploy this simple model that you build even a heuristic even a series of ifs so you right. if you can write a series of ifs deploy a series of ifs because they're easy to deploy they're so easy to deploy mm -hmm. right but make sure you have a working pipeline so so that that's that's what i recommend and that's what i do i i use the simplest thing that works a series of ifs or a simple model and deploy them as an end-to-end -end pipeline and make sure it's integrated into the system, make sure everybody sees this because uh, this, this has two advantages. Um, on the one hand, it's really easy to grow this pipeline afterwards, right? And, mm -hmm. and evaluate your model and get a better model uh, and uh, yeah, uh, put stuff on your resume basically. But, but then uh, while you're evaluating this, these better models, you can also see if they work as well as your simple baseline model or how better, um, you know, you can compare their accuracy, accuracy of the fancy model with the accuracy of the simple model and see and, and decide 
whether the, uh, the added complexity of the of the new model is worth the uh, the increase in accuracy, because if it is just a tiny increase in accuracy and the, it's a huge increase in complexity or hardware requirements, mm -hmm. then it yeah, may not, not be worth it. So, so yeah. I want you to, to, to pick up on something you just said, because uh, at some point you say, well, but that's not uh, craftsmanship. And, and this was a very interesting thing you said, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because there are a few things that, it's not, I, I, how can I put that in a way that I'm, I will not be misinterpreted? I think that a few people in the craftsmanship world uh, took certain things to the extreme, this notion of quality, and they completely lost sight of pragmatism. So, so then, uh, for example, we have some people, they are the minority, right? So there's always the exceptional cases, but for example, that became prima donnas, right? So they say, you know what? We need to create the best code possible. Everything, every single semicolon needs to be perfect and stuff. And they completely forget about the needs of the business, about the constraints, including time and money. They are real constraints for business, right? And, and they completely, throw down the drain pragmatism. On the other hand, there is a, another uh, uh, extreme that you say that there is a, uh, that pragmatism is just like a, a fancy word to, to cut corners, to justify shit code. And, and, and I disagree with both sides. And, and, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because I've seen in the, the very few contacts that I had in the uh, ML uh, world and AI world. Some people really criticizing, oh, this is not ML, this is just a bunch of ifs and stuff. And I'm glad that you brought that out because like sometimes that's all you need. Because, and, and, and this is also craftsmanship because for me, craftsmanship is like, what is the best solution that we can come up with right now that you provide our uh, the best return on, on investment. And you are conscious, if you are incurring, if you are incurring any technical debt, you made that as a conscious decision. You, you know what is right or wrong, you know what is ideal, what is not, but you made an analysis of context in terms of time, money, cost, or all that, that kind of stuff, the, the fast feedback that you want. So for example, would we be better off having something that works in the next couple of weeks, or should we try to strive for this beautiful thing that just exists in our heads and wait six months to get that done? And that for me is not craftsmanship. But the evolutionary approach of starting with something simpler, it, it can be clean, it can still be clean, it can be testable, it can be well designed, but it's just a simplistic solution. Or a, it's a simple solution. It's just and that's what you need. And then you can evolve, as you were saying. And that's for me, totally aligned to craftsmanship. What is not aligned to craftsmanship is to ignore uh, business concerns, ignore everything, and you start pushing your ideals of quality in a system at the expense of things that are far more important. And that's for me, it's not craftsmanship. So, so I, 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 I agree with you. I think that sometimes what you need is a simple solution. Oh, and even like uh, uh, Kent Beck, when, uh, when, when we talk about software craftsmanship practices now, so, so now it's a bit like a, away from the, the movement, the, the mindset, it's more like some of the practices. One of the design practices that came from extreme programming are the four rules of simple design. So the focus on simplicity has been ingrained in software craftsmanship from the early days of always striving to the simplest solution possible and only introduce complexity. So complexity is a trade-off, right? If you need to. So, so yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to, to touch on that because, yeah, it, it's aligned for me with craftsmanship. Yeah, it's it's good, good to be intentional in what you do. You know, so, yeah. so yeah, pick, pick the simple solution, pick, pick the quick and dirty. So Paul Graham, right? Paul Graham, he, he was uh, advocating about doing things that don't scale at the beginning. Yeah, when you're in a position, when, when speed matters, do things that don't scale, uh, involve stuff manually, but, but then- But move you know, forward, right? Move, move forward, exactly, exactly. Move, get feedback, evolve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dan. I was going to say that listening to you both, 
the same things apply, right? We've been, uh, let's say, striving our, to do soft to build software uh, iteratively and incrementally. And if you're talking about uh, ML projects, this still applies, right? So this is one of the common things. Um, however, if because we're running a bit out of time, so then uh, if I can have one last question, it's my turn, Sandro. Uh, yeah, would be if you're a software crafts person, right, doing traditional project, what, and maybe this is more for Vlad, what skills do you think, uh, do you think that person would need to uh, yeah, enter the AI zone? I, and I, and I come from a, a really biased point because I, I think that that's what I kind of did, uh, but not that much. <laughs> no, but but I, I'm, I'm I think uh, you can get away with uh, with knowing far less now than uh, you used to be able to some years ago, right? Because um, I do think that the, this part where uh, we, we train models, yeah, we we evaluate them, uh, we we pick the best model, the the programming part, let, let's put it like that. I do believe that this will get automated away. Yeah, I know. Uh, if you remember, so I, in in college, I used to to know all kinds of sorting algorithms, right? And I could implement uh, quite a few of them, right? But right now, I just do list sorts, and we lost them. Um, he he was on a four G connection. Yeah, I think. yeah. Oh, there he is. He's back. Stop. Now we have two guns. Way too much. I just. <laughs> I just really? switched laptops, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but I, I was saying right right now, I just do a list sort and it gets sorted. I, I don't really care about the the implementation of the the algorithm of the sorting algorithm. Uh, I just I, I trust the framework that it's fast enough and that it's good enough for what I'm trying to achieve. We're not there with machine learning algorithm, right? But there are um a series of uh, automated machine learning initiatives right of frameworks that just and everybody seems to want to build their own tool for this right that, that take your data set and run it through yeah ask you what do you want to predict right do you want to predict the weather outside do you want to predict i don't know fraud whatever what do you want to predict and what data are you trying to predict on and then evaluate different models with different settings and find out who wins, right? And that part is beginning to be automated, but what's not automated is the data. Yeah, you still you still need to be able to, to gather the right data to make sure that, uh, you know, um, the data is representative, the data that you feed to these models or, or to whatever model. It's, uh, it, it's enough data it's uh, it has enough features. The features are correlated with what you're trying to, to forecast, right? So, so at the moment, I feel that uh, our focus is uh, is a bit too much on the on the develop on the modeling part, and too little on the data part, right? And I, I believe Andrew Ung, you know, of uh, the co-founder of Coursera, of YouTube fame. Uh, he even launched a movement, the data-centric AI, right? That basically says, let's not focus on algorithms that much. Let's focus on data more, right? So, so, so and, basically, you think like just just for me to understand, like uh, coming from Dan's uh, question, uh, you feel that one of the core skills for people potentially going from traditional software development to more AI focus, one of the skills to develop is understanding data, is, anal is analyzing data. Is that where you're coming from? More than just trying to learn some algorithms. Is that what you're trying to say? That That is a so much better phrasing than I, than I managed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandra. Yes, that is what I was trying to say. Okay, In a very convoluted okay. way. Yeah. You could have okay. said two minutes as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can see that how that differs because, like, well, I don't think we do that enough in traditional software. In fact, I think that database modeling, the same way that I, architecture, are some skills that we've been losing over the years. 
I think that even traditional engineers are not paying much attention to structuring data or preparing data in ways that would be more suitable for specific projects. Mainly now that we have cloud computing, that we have distributed more and more distributed systems. So the way that we, that definition of who owns which data, how we get the data that you need from other parts of the system that owns that, how do you feed that data to, uh, for example, from, from the AI, ML, parts of the system, how do you, what do you do with that information coming from those systems? So that, that kind of data analysis and higher level architecture is a skill that I don't see, it was more common in the past than it is now, let's, let's put it this way. Yes, so nowadays things get more and more abstracted due to various uh, technologies, but uh, yeah, now you're going into the field of AI and they're needed again. Mm. Uh, there was a guy, sorry, there was a guy that, uh, uh, so he said like, yeah, a lot of people are now creating data, uh, they, they talk about data lakes, uh, but they are creating data swamps. That, that's what they were called. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, as long as nobody realizes, they're, they're okay. <laughs> yeah. You probably realize that uh, two years down the road, especially since you don't have data versioning. <laughs> yep. So so do we have any other more questions or I can ask another one or we are wrapping up, so what's happening? Ask another question, Sandro, and then we're gonna wrap up. Okay. Uh, so the, let me see, uh, are there some, technical practices that are important while building the codes uh, and just comparing like in, in a traditional project, at least in the craftsmanship world, we will always focus on test driven development, we will be focusing on uh, pair programming as, as practices. Uh, we also will be talking about clean code, uh, like concepts of clean code that there is a book on it, there are other uh, things, we talk about object-oriented uh, object oriented or functional programming design. So there are many things that we pay attention when we are hiring a developer or we are analyzing the skill set at the low level. I'm not talking about actual level, more than low level. Are there guidelines uh, in AI for clean code, for example, or even testing? Is, are there methodologies or guidelines for those things? Um, so for Regarding the code, uh, it's pretty much, yeah, you, while you're building code, it, it's the same as with traditional software, right? You should have unit tests, but you, you may maybe test uh, some other thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you may test that, uh, you may create a unit test that checks that you're training a, a model, let's say, if, it, if it, you're lucky to, to have it train fast enough so that, uh, that it works in a unit mm -hmm. test. But then you may have some uh, some other tests that, that just check your data, right? So since data is code, right? Mm -hmm. When you're ingesting that data, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically, yeah, you, you, you build a pipeline that ingests the data. Mm -hmm. But then you need to check that data as it comes, right? So, so like somebody's continually writing code. So mm -hmm. you may want to, I don't know, check the, the distribution of values, check that, uh, I don't know, in your weather prediction their model, uh, there are, um, I don't know, the, the average value for uh, weather is uh, 20 degrees. I don't know, I'm just pulling this uh, out of my head. Or maybe the, the standard distribution for some models uh, looks in a, a certain way, or maybe they, they only have uh, between five and 10% missing values, no more, no less because that's the, the structure of the data set that you use to, tra to train your own model. And that's the structure of the data set that you can, uh, you can confidently say that, look, it has this performance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but but for, for regular uh, code writing, yes, you, you should do tests. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what, what I found uh, and stumbled upon was, uh, a number of data scientists just run things on their machine because mm -hmm. since, since this whole process is very experimental, they need mm -hmm. to run a lot of experiments and it, it's so easy to run on your machine, right? But then mm -hmm. these don't, don't really get translated into production ready code. So I, I think this is, this is a vital skill, you know, just uh, on the one hand, 
understand the data. Yeah, we'll make sure uh, you understand its characteristics of statistics or data visualization. And then make sure um, you're able to, to build your models in a, in a very reproducible way, right? It shouldn't just work on your machine. I see. Yeah, I know that you are running out of time. I just want to share something with uh, people because like, uh, I normally able to test drive almost everything I want to do. And there were very, very few occasions where I was not able to, and I had to retrofit the test later. And it was when I was playing with a genetic algorithm. Uh, so, because I had no clue what the outcome would be. I said like, okay, if I pass these things to the, the thing that I'm trying to build, I don't know what the outcome should be exactly. So I could not have an exact test that I say, like, if I pass these, I trigger my code, I expect that. I didn't know what the result was, so I could not assert. And, and because it was highly experimental, I had to keep tweak, tweaking all the different parameters until I, let's say, manually training my model and figure it out if it would do what I wanted. There were so many different parameters that I was tweaking all the time until I found what I wanted. That I said, you know what, screw that, print stuff to the console, run the bloody thing, let me see like loads of things happening and see kind of trying to plot up a graph uh, uh, and see if the, the trajectory is going where I want. And then I said, I think now I'm getting to where I want, let's put some tests around that. But but because of the, 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 the amount of uncertainties and change and experimentation, test-driven development was not a good fit for that at all. Yeah, yeah. Or may, maybe it's a, it's a good fit, but, you know, just for, for the code that brings in data and the one that trains the model and the training of the model should not be tested. You know, because yeah, or try to write your feet once the model is tested. So yeah. just to prevent someone to destroy whatever you trained, right? So I don't know. Yeah, but in any case, so ideally you should uh, you should evaluate your model when when pushing code, right? When you push code to your repo, some some machine in the cloud should take your model, retraining on the data they have, evaluate it, and write the metrics somewhere, right? So 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 you you're sure that you're not messing things up, right? Because, yeah, it's, as you say, it's highly experimental. And you probably uh, ran this algorithm locally. You probably tracked your results. Uh, you, you maybe had a an Excel file or a text file with the performance on, of the algorithms for, for different uh, hyperparameter combinations. Yeah, because what you were doing is basically hyperparameter tuning mm -hmm. yeah, by, by hand. So, yeah, you need to have that. and you probably, especially if you're working in a bigger team, yeah, you need to communicate with your teammates who may or may not be working on the same prob project, um, right, or, or problem. So you may want to have a, a centralized place where you keep these uh, these metrics, because you you always need to track things. Yeah, that's that's I think is paramount to, to be able to to see how the the performance your, of your model goes, hopefully up. <laughs> I'm going to make a parallel to your uh, unit testing situation, Sandro. So this is also about yeah, not knowing what uh, will come out of it or what we expect. It's exactly how we shaped this conversation. So we had the topic and the whole idea was to explore things. Yeah. So I'm not sure uh, what the conclusions should uh, should be at the moment, although it's been a, yeah interesting presentation, at least for me. Uh, yeah, so for me, uh, the same. I just joined. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for the invitation. Uh, thanks for having me in the code camp again. And for me, like, I came here just to, to talk, to, to have a nice conversation, try to learn a little bit more uh, from Vlad and for yourself, like, how do we do things in ML and AI and how does it compare to, to, to traditional projects, to things that I'm more on. But I was not expecting any conclusion, but I, I liked the exchange. I like to learn more. I could carry on going, but I appreciate that we are short of time. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do a sequel then. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I hope uh, the rest of the people out there uh, also enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. And I can also drag in my partner in crime, Florin, to mm -hmm. take this opportunity to close Hi, uh, this day of camp together. Hello.